79, almost tied. Okay. All right, so I think it's time. 10.30, that's right. And, hmm. But this classroom has a mic, so I might wanna try this out. If we can, if I can find a microphone, the wireless mic. So I'll give you guys a choice. Do you want me to show you really strange buggy programs where the symptom is like really awkward? Or do you want me to show you how to hack a program first? Add both? Hmm? So oh, we'll do both. Okay. It's just a matter of you know, which one goes first. Uh, uh, first. Buggy program. Okay, buggy program. <laughs> buggy program. Buggy program, okay. So we'll, we'll go with the buggy program. So let's see. It is working. Good, great. Okay. Yeah, the room 121 is too small, so they did not you know, even bother to install a mic and a PA. But this lab is kind of big, especially to people to back. So they install uh, these you know, speakers. Um, and the nice thing is, I can uh, walk around, and my mic will still pick up you know, pretty much the same volume. Which is uh, which is which is good because otherwise, you know, when I walk around, you know, you guys might have noticed if you watch the video. Sometimes it get it just kind of faints, you know, fade away, and then sometimes it get, you know, um, louder again. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at some interesting buggy programs, and I don't have it here because it's in my virtual machine. So let's go to my virtual machine, start it up first. And once again, you know, the virtual machine the virtual machine starts up really fast for me because I'm using Linux and I'm using the accelerator built into the uh, QEMU code. So that's why mine starts like super fast. Once it starts up, you know, I can connect to it either using PuTTY because PuTTY is actually available for um, Linux as well, or I can just use SSH to do it. So I'm just gonna use SSH because it's just a command line, it's just a lot easier to do that like this. Um, the only thing I have to remember is to specify the port number is 2200 because otherwise the assumed port number is 22. Yeah. And now I'm in the virtual machine. And inside this virtual machine, oh, I thought I did that program here. But that's okay, I don't need it to be here, I can just craft the program. To, uh, to illustrate all these kind of interesting bugs. So I would just call these buggy1.c and I'll define a function that returns nothing and it does not take any parameters. Okay. It does have, have a local um, variable which is an array that has let's say four items and one thing, the only thing I'm going to do to it is to change an array element that does not actually belong to the array. Okay, so I'm gonna access the array out of bound. So I'm gonna say, hey, since x has four elements, I'm just gonna access you know, the you know, x bracket four, which does not exist, right? Because you know, the last element is x bracket three, x bracket four does not actually exist. And I'm not gonna assign a value all I'm going to do is to add 4 to whatever is there to begin with. Okay? Is that okay so far? Okay? This is C notation. Everybody should understand at least you know, what it means in C. But what you may not know is, oh, but if I try to access an array out of bound, what is it going to do? Now, if this is BB, it would just you know, crash. 
Well, it doesn't crash, it gives you, you know, a box and say, okay, on this line, you're trying to access an array out of bound, I'm not gonna proceed any further, which is actually the right thing to do. But C doesn't do that. C basically just look at the four bytes after the last element of the array and say, if there is, if there was a fifth element, it's there. <laughs> and it would just start to use it as if it had, it's the fifth element, okay? All right. And now we go back to main, and we'll define a few local variables in main. We'll just say x is, um, well, we can use abc if we want to. So a is a local variable in main, starts with the value of 6. Um, I'll just do it on separate lines. Uh, b is also a local variable. It starts with the value of 51. And then we have C, which is also a local variable, starts with the value of negative 4. Okay, just some random values. And I just call F, and here's a return 0 from main. So the program doesn't really do anything exciting at all. Um, but it's going to do something that is really funky. Okay, the, the end result of this code is going to be like, what? You know, what is it doing? Okay. All right, so this is the first buggy program that has a symptom that is extremely hard to find out why unless you finish this class, unless you take this class all the way to the end. So we'll go ahead and compile the program with debug information because we do want to get back to the source code. And we'll, the program name is buggy1. I'll name the executable as buggy1 as well. And let's see. There we go. And then we use Okay, when you, if you run the program by itself, it's gonna crash, okay? But that's not the problem. The problem is before it crashes, it has some really unexplainable or seemingly unexplainable symptom. So we'll use GDB to, look at, to run the program so that when it does bomb out, we can kind of collect some messages. But I'm not even go that far, okay? So what I'll do is I am going, L stands for list, so whatever program that has a source code, L will list the source code of that program. And what I want to do is to stop on line 14. So B14 means you'll put a breakpoint on line 14. And I will also put a breakpoint on line 15, right after the function returns. So B15 here. So now the program has two breakpoints, you know, and R starts running the program at full speed. Okay, so here's R. I'm at the first breakpoint right before F is called. And I want to look at all the local variables. I think there's a way to show all the local variables on one single line, but I cannot remember what it is. So I'm just going to say print A, print B, print C, nothing unexpected. They are exactly as they should be initialized. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, good, okay. So now I continue execution with this program at full speed. I'm not even going to bother to trace what um, the subroutine is doing, even though it's wrong. So I continue to trace the program, and now we are back from the subroutine call, and I want to look at the three values of the variables again. Print A, print B, print C. Do you see a pattern? They seem to be shifted. Everything is shifted by four bytes. Now, if I ask you which line is causing this to, causing this to happen, everybody can point to the line where I access the array out of bound, right? But if I ask you why this is the symptom, then you probably, you know, don't have a, an exact idea of why it is doing that. Okay, so let me just get out of the uh, debugger first and just look at the source code one more time. Okay, this is the source code. And you know, if I gave you a program like this, yes, you can spot the problem <coughs> right away and just say, hey, Jack, you're accessing an array out of bound, and that's the reason why the program is bombing out. Yes? So what exactly is happening there? I, I may just not understand C program. So, so X, uh, what is that line? Okay, let me turn on line number so we can point out which line you're talking about. Okay, we're in five. On line five? What exactly is happening? You mean in C? Yeah. Mm. Okay. <coughs> you, you should know that stuff right now, but I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. When you, when you 
create an array, you gave the array four, right? But the very first element in the array is, is labeled zero. Yeah. So really that array is zero, one, two, and three, not one, two, three, four. So when you went to level to the fourth block on that imaginary four blocks, he's really going to the fifth block. Oh, okay. So you're okay. I see. You're not asking questions about what the syntax or what it is, what it's specifying. You're asking what it's actually doing, yes. Or why it's causing problems. Why is that wrong? That's what he's why is it wrong? Like what, like what is it doing yeah. that it's not supposed to do? It's trying to get to the yeah, fifth so, block so the, so on the, a so four the four element the array. Yeah, so no, he's, he's, he's the, getting to the fourth. The index, if, you just, if you put like 25 there, it would have made a lot more sense to me. But what? Really just, what, 25? Yeah. Well, I mean, just to show that like, you're all the way out. But yeah. Yeah. But you only have to be out by one to cause this problem to happen. Yeah. 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 He just forgot that the first element is, is, is the zero element. Yeah, I just not forgot that the, 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 you're, you're starting with zero? Well, when you count, count the array. If, I think if you look at that he, he got, the equation, got Okay, what is plus equal four? So you're adding four to whatever is on the left hand side. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's called um, it's called a compound assignment operator. But that's got nothing to do with why we're having problems. It no, does. it has everything to do with why we are having that particular problem. That value, that value <laughs> is, is still getting placed somewhere. So that memory location, there's a four sitting there that's probably somehow creating this problem. No, it's, it's not the four, it is the plus four that is causing the problem. It's the fact that you're trying to yeah. alter what's at that location. Right, mm -hmm. like yeah. but I, I'm just nudging it a little bit. I'm only nudging that value by four. Now, if I were to put a zero into that place, the program would just crash. It's like, whoop, yeah, done. Now, does that correspond to four bits? No, it corresponds to four bytes, and that's why all the variables are shifted by four bytes. Uh, <coughs> yeah, but, what are the chances that you might write a program that has something like this? The chances is zero. But what are the chances that you might have something like this where it is not x bracket four, it's x bracket i, and i is a variable that you control in the loop, and that loop is inside the conditional statement, which is inside another loop. Oh, it can happen, likely. right? What are the chances that you're passing that array to another function and you pass the wrong number of elements, so the other function thinks there are more elements than it, it should have. Very likely, right? Yeah. But don't, don't most compilers catch that? No. no. Why would a compiler catch that? Yeah. All that happens in runtime. Because you're a programmer, you're a genius. Remember, C and C++, not, not C++ so much, but C is a tool um, designed and invented by gurus who wrote Unix, which forms the foundation of iOS, right? So those guys are saying, okay, I'm, I'm making a chainsaw for myself. Forget about all the safety features. We don't need those safety features. I know how to use a chainsaw left and right. I can operate it with my feet, okay? So there are no safety features. C has no safety features, okay? It trusts you. <laughs> You are the expert. If you think this is okay, hey, do it. I don't really care. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's C and C++. I mean, you know, they are programming languages where you can make mistakes like this, and it will let you make the mistake, do whatever you specify, and give you the result. Yep. What happens if you throw a five here instead? Then you would have some really oddball values because you know now they are not byte I mean forward or thirty to be aligned anymore. So you end up with some really huge values in the variables in main. Now I'm not gonna go too deep into you know what can happen when you twitch this value and whatnot. If you guys want to, okay, it's getting screen recorded, you guys can just retype the program and you know experiment with this program a little bit. But the point is, okay. The chances of you having a program using pointers for arrays, accessing an array out of bound, and nudge a value that you're not supposed to nudge, you know, by a little bit, is pretty high. The question is, when, when your program has a symptom that this program has, where a subroutine has its own local variable shifted, can you, you know, start debugging that program? And where do you start? That's the question. <coughs> How do you take the actual symptom of this program that is buggy 
can have a method to trace that problem back to the origin? That is the question. So one of the objectives of this class is to give you the tools and the knowledge to do this. Unless people say, who programs in C anymore? Come on, <laughs> you know, we only use Java and, and Python. <laughs> Well, if, if someone you know, gives me that, you know, I have no answer because you know, Python does not have pointers and Java does not have pointers. You cannot have this kind of mistake when you have a, a programming language that has no pointers that cannot let, let you access memory locations directly. Okay? But I think, okay, this is just my humble opinion, that C and C++ are still very important programming languages as far as employment is concerned. Okay, the Linux kernel is not written in Java yet. And it will never be written in Java because I don't think uh, Torvo likes uh, Oracle <laughs> or the other way around either. <laughs> well, I think the CEO may have something to do with that. That if the, job, if the JVM is written in C, hmm? so unless the JVM is written in Java, there would be no JVM point. is most likely written in C. Yep. Well, I, I suppose you know at a certain point they can write you know the JVM in Java. <laughs> okay, so here's one program that is kind of broken, but in a strange way. Let me give you another one that is also broken, but in a strange way as well. Okay, so I'm going to give you buggy2. F is kind of the same thing with a local array that is an, a, an array of four elements. And this time I'm using a bracket 5, okay? And I'm also only going to change it a little bit. Um, but this time I have to kind of really, really work, you know, to get this to work the way I want it. So before we do that, I'm going to give you function g, which does not do a single thing, but it does have one line of code, just so that I have a place to put a breakpoint, because otherwise there's no way to stop in function g, which is important. And here's main, and this time main does not even have local variables. All it does is to call f and then return itself, okay? So I have to craft this one a little bit more carefully, so I, let me think about this a little bit, okay? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to cast it. Okay, I want to end up there. Okay, so I want this. Okay, and I think I need a prototype here, because otherwise the C compiler is going to complain. And this one is for five, that is correct. Okay, so here we go. So, okay, you can see that I'm really, really crafting this program to crash in a certain way. But the number here, I'm just you know, cheating here, okay? Instead of you know, just experimenting to find out which value works, I'm just you know, giving it exactly the value that will work, okay? But this number is gonna be in a very small range, like 31-ish, okay? 20-something, 30-something. In other words, it is likely that you know you might have some code that can nudge an out of bound array element just by this much to have sim the same kind of symptom. Okay, so even though the program looks really crafted, it's like yeah, yeah, you know, who's going to write code like that, right? But in reality, the chances of this happening is actually pretty high because I have had programs that have that this type of symptoms. Yep. Uh, pardon me, but um, so. You're passing in g, but g is a function which you're passing in as a variable? Like no, it's the address of g. M plus n is so address of g. Right. right. Um, but so, but it, it's actually a function. So you don't need the parentheses. Yeah. You're not because I, the I'm not calling it. I'm just asking, where's the, where, where's the address of g and where's the address of f? I want to do the subtraction to find out what is the actual the number of bytes between the two functions. And that's it's, it's not going to ask you and say, like, isn't that a variable? Uh, so like, you declare the variable? No, doesn't, it, it, that, there's no problem because in C and C++, you can take the address of a function. It's part of the programming language. So never, never. And because you wrote it outside, never did that or even it's like kind of like it's a, it's a global thing. It is a global name because the G has a prototype prior to this line. So that as far as the C uh, compiler is concerned, the G is a function that has no return value and no parameters. And that's all it needs to really you know, be happy about it. Right. Okay, so, but the most important part is what exactly is the symptom when this program runs? 
So once again, we use uh, the same type of setup here. GDB buggy two. List the program, and I want to put a breakpoint on line eighteen, and put a breakpoint on line nineteen. Um, yeah, that should be enough. So run the program, single step. Okay, you know lowercase s, you know is single stepping. So I'm just doing executing one line at a time. So now we get into function f. Okay, function f performs this operation, and now we are at the end of function f. Where should it return to? Who main. called F? The main. Main called F. So when it's done, it should return to main, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it did return to F, to main. Okay, I did not do my math correctly then. Wait, hold on a sec. Is that? Yeah, it is in main. So I did not do my math correctly. Okay. Fourth, fifth. Okay, I'm just going to do this a little bit here. This is F, this is G. G is after F. Okay. They're off by 37 bytes. You are right, you know, it might have optimized uh, G out completely, but I'm not, I don't think it has optimized G out completely. Well, I'll just give it something. <laughs> I'll just fudge it. BF means put a breakpoint at the entry point of function F. So we'll go ahead and run the program, single step. Okay, this is line seven, and it just crashes this time because it doesn't it doesn't have a correct instruction to go back to. Okay. And you can you can see that I'm really just nudging this at this point. Okay, single step, single step. Ah, okay, it doesn't, doesn't do that, or, okay. So what you were trying to play with was how many bytes those functions do for taking like with all the parameters and... What I'm trying to do is to have it to return, not to main, but return to G. To just, okay. But G is never called from anywhere within, within this program. Yeah. But it can happen. I have seen it happen with my own programs. So when your memory is corrupted, there is a chance that it's corrupted in a very strange way where it returns not to the function that called it, but to return to some other, in the middle of some other functions. So how do you debug programs like that? <laughs> the source of the problem, obviously, is you know, x bracket 5 plus equal to 31, but it's spelled out so clearly here that you can see it. But when you have that, as you know, x bracket i plus equal to you know, some gazillion you know, difficult you know, expressions, it doesn't stand out anymore. And it's buried within a function that has like 40 or 50 lines. And that function may not, you know, may be called with a pointer to begin with. So it's not even you know, directly you know, being called by the subroutine that is messed up. So now you're so far removed from the source of the problem by the time you see the symptom it's way too late already because you might go through the function they're not supposed to go to, a few statements, before it crashes. Then, you, you, then you're scratching your head and go like, why am I even in this function to begin with? So your natural tendency is to think, you know, whoever is calling the function is at fault, and then you find out nobody's calling that function. How do you end up in the middle of a function when nobody's calling it? Yep. So is C putting the array That's correct. Yeah. So they're they're basically consecutive, except you know, there's a return instruction at the end of one function and before the beginning of the next function. 
Oh, so you're trying to skip that return function and have it right. progress in the gene. Okay. Well, okay, let, let me try it one more time. This might work. Yep, there we go. You see, it just went to function G. Yep. That's it. So what is actually stored in X sub 5 is? The return address. Size. <laughs> I overwrote the return address explicitly. Now this one is obvious because you can see that I store the uh, address of G in you know, a place I'm not supposed to access. But it is possible that you just nudge it enough to really do that. Because we saw the difference between uh, function G and function F is only 30, uh, 37 bytes. Hmm. So the chances of you nudging it enough just to do that is pretty high. Now, if the function G is really long, then you have a lot of possible values that will work. So therefore, you, know, you, you can have funny programs where just knowing C really, really well doesn't really help you debug the program. Because none of this can be explained when you just talk about local variables, arrays, function calls, and stuff like that. You have to understand what is what other stuff is stored on the stack in addition to local variables and how those things are utilized when you execute a program. That's what this class will talk about in the second half of the semester. Okay? And, those, and, so, and I, I can see someone is really bored in this class and go like, I never make a single mistake when I write programs, and these things will never, ever bother me at all. And by the way, I'm only going to write programs in Python. C is so old school, I'm going Python all the way. Okay? And of course, by the time you guys graduate, Python is no longer hot. There will be some other language, Taipan, or whatever <laughs> snake they want to use at that point. You know, make it poisonous, right? All right. So next program, next thing I'm, I, I want to do is to uh, crack a program. So this is the program that I want to crack. Okay, so let me download it first. Okay, it's in, my, in the host, so I'm going to use SCP to copy that. So SCP downloads, what is the name of the program again? It's called hack, okay, to user at localhost. Oh, forgot to specify the port number. Um, I want to copy to the home folder of user, which is the tilde symbol. And the password of user is just user. So now if I go back to the emulator, it should have it here. Okay, so we have, you know, hack 123.stript. First thing I need to do is to do a shamod because it's not executable right now. So I say user plus execute permission, and now I can run the program. Okay. So this program is basically asking you to type a password at the, at the command line. And if the password matches, it will let you, you know, access uh, special features of this program. If not, it will just say, OK, you don't have the password. Go away. Okay? So I'm just going to test it with some random passwords. And it says, you know, read, define a, a digital millennium copyright act. That's what the RTFEMCA stands for. Okay. okay. Nobody's getting it. What is the DMCA? Do you like the DMCA? Why not? <laughs> Good question. There we go. Okay. So, so to hack this program, I can try all day long, you know, and it doesn't work. Okay. Okay. Fine. So, what am I going to do with this program? Well, I want to oh. hack it. Okay, so I, I'm suspecting this program makes use of uh, some functions that really should not be used, like string copy and stuff like that. Okay, uh, but I have no confirmation, so what I'll do is I'm going to design a, a file to test just that. Okay, so the first thing I want to do, because it's reading from standard in, so the first thing I want to do is to um, create a file called password.txt and I'll just give it some random stuff like this. Okay. The more random, the better, because we don't want repeating patterns. Okay. I don't know how long it will take you know, to crack the program, but I'm just going to keep trying. So now I run the program again, dot slash hack, blah, blah, blah. 
my Mac. Oh. And redirect from you know the file. This is a redirection in Linux, or it, it actually works in Windows as well. So the less than symbol is saying, okay, instead of expecting me to type something on the command line, expect the input to this program to come from password.txt. So this way, I don't have to keep typing and typing and typing. I can just you know, create a file and just say, okay, read this file as if I'm typing it. Okay. Okay, it's still not cracking. You know, it's not crashing, but I'm not giving up either. So I'm going to say, all right, make this longer. All right. Looks a little longer. Aha! Segmentation fault. Yes. <laughs> okay. Because if the input is too long and the program crashes, it tells me that I might have a way to hack it. Okay. Now, who is going to write a program where the expected behavior of a program when the input is invalid is to crash with a segmentation fault? Probably no one, right? Okay. Unless your objective is to fool hackers to think that they can hack the program because it crashes. Now that actually might not be a bad thing to do, you know, just so that you know, the hackers or the would-be hackers would just waste their time <laughs> thinking that you know, oh, here's a security hole. Let me check it out and see how I can crack this program. But the crash is actually intentional, and there's actually no way to hack the program. Otherwise known as honey pots, right? So now that the program is crashing, I'm going to do it in GDB to see exactly how it is crashing. Okay, Because instead of just saying that it's crashing, I want to know more details. So I say GDB uh, hack uh, 132 stripped like that. So instead of typing all of that stuff here, when I run the program in GDB, I can do exactly the same thing, you know, the redirection thing. So I can say R less than password.txt. So it will just run the program and use the text file to feed uh, standard in. Okay. So once again, it crashes and go like, okay, Tag, you know, what have you learned? Well, what about that number? See that number? You know, zero x four eight two six two eight two eight in dollar. Okay. Wow. That's just some random number here. Well, let's let's check it out. Okay, I think the range of the number is a little bit special because if you look at each individual byte of this four byte number, they all fall within the range of printable ASCII code. Two questions. Yep. Um, the two question marks. It means it doesn't know what it oh, is. Okay. It doesn't know the name of the function or okay. the label. Like, but, but, the actual name. Yeah, but that's absolutely that's absolutely natural because I stripped the okay. executable of all symbol you know, symbolic information. So there's no way I, I make sure that I cannot just read the symbol table and just cheat my way out of this one. It has no symbol table whatsoever. It is really just the executable. Okay. But we are knowing at least it's showing us that. It's at a function. It's, it's at a function, correct. Yep. Mm, well, it no, it's not at a function, it's an address, okay, where you cannot really execute code. That's why you get a segmentation fault. It's trying to execute code at a location that you do not have access to, okay? So, but what I want to know is, okay, what exactly is 482628A and 28 in terms of ASCII code? So I'm going to write it down on a piece of paper. You don't have to do that or copy what I'm doing here. I'm just doing it in on the piece of paper, and I quit this. You know, I can always redo it you know, if I need to, and then I say man ASCII, which prints the ASCII code table. So I'm going to look it up and say what is four eight, and um, this is the column corresponding to hexadecimal yeah. number. So we have a uppercase H here, and then the two six is two six is an emperor's and. So we have H, an Amper's and a 2A, which is an asterisk, and then a 2A, which is open parenthesis. Okay? All right. So the next thing I do is I go back to the file that I created and look for those four characters. They should be next to each other. Okay? Now, this is also one place where people go, like, what the, what the hell is going on here? Because if I just search for H, 
um, ampers and um, asterisk and open parenthesis, it does not exist. But if I reverse the order, it does, okay? Because you can actually see it right here. Okay. You see that here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that means for some really strange, maybe not so strange reasons, a part of the ASCII code in this file became the return address of a function that is broken. But that means if I craft these four bytes to a certain number, I might be able to make the program go to a particular place that I wanted to go to. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is to say, okay, let's not crash the program entirely anymore. Okay. I don't want this pattern. To, I, I don't want this program to have these extra stuff anymore, because I just want to remember the last four bytes is what what counts. Okay. Because this way I don't have to go look for these four bytes anymore later on. Okay, and after this, I just want to run the program again, just to make sure that it does crash exactly the same way as last time, because I don't want this to you know, change the behavior of the program. So I say r less than in a password.txt, and the program crash exactly the same way. So this is just you know, double checking, making sure that by changing the text file, I'm not changing the behavior of how this program is crashing. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, it's all good so far? Okay. So the next thing I want to do is to say, okay, but my, my objective is not to crash the program, but to gain um, access to stuff that needs that is password protected, right? Okay. So now what I do is I say, okay, let me take a look at this program in the main portion. Okay, so I say quit and do an object dump of you know this hack program, and I want it to. Disassemble is good. Disassemble all dash d dash x dash d would be useful. So I want to do a dash x dash uppercase d and then pipe it to less so just so that I can go back and forth. Okay. So this is the header, the you know, program header, which shows you where the um, various sections of the program is located. I do have a little bit of a simple table. It's not entirely there anymore, but I do know where the program is starting which is underscore start. And then we have some section names, which is also useful. Okay. And then we have disassemble code of this program. So this, this is the program disassembled in assembly code. So I'm looking for something specific. Okay, dot init, dot text. Okay, so dot text is important. Because the dot text is basically the section where um, the executable code of a program is located, at least you know, when it's produced by GCC and it's running on a Linux box. Okay, so all of these are instructions. If you don't know what these instructions mean, that's fine. Okay, because you know, it's not something that we have talked about at this point. Okay, so we want to look at the entry point of this entire program, which I'm thinking is located at eight zero four eight four seven. 4, uh, 7F. So we go to 4, 7F. Why do you think it's there? Because, um, okay, so I'm suspecting this is the main uh, code uh, for the entire program. And the reason why I suspect that is because um, in the other code, let me, let me go back to the other code first. Okay. Because it is pushed before um, it's call, it called this function. And the name of the library, this is a libc function. It's a C library function. It's not a part of this particular program. But the name suggests what? That it's the main. Start main, right? Okay. And once we talk about you know, how parameters are passed, then you will start to see oh, all the pushes are pushing parameters. And the first parameter is pushed last. And I have a suspicion that this is the first parameter, which is the location of main. And that's why you know, I have a strong suspicion of this is the entry point of the main subroutine itself. Okay. So I start to look into this and go like, okay, so let's go check out the location 47F. So I fast forward a little bit to 47F, which is at this point. And this is a fairly useful instruction at the beginning of every single subroutine. I can definitely recognize this as the beginning of a subroutine. 
Um, and then it has this function here. This is also very important because you can see the label is put S or put string. Okay? Put string is a very low level function to print a string to the screen, which is why I saw RTF DMCA. Okay? So this is telling me that, hey, this is one of the branches. This is in the middle of a branch where it's printing something. Okay, so I want to look at all the put s here. There's another one here. And when you're printing a string, put s has one parameter, which is the string that is being printed, right? And that is the push right before the call. So now I can look at the, what is pushing, what is at this location. Is it, you know, printing, redefine, you know, digital millennium copyright act, or is it saying, yes, you've got it. We are now accessing full feature of this program. So I need to look at these numbers here, okay, and figure out whether it is the string that I want or the string that I do not want, okay? Because I can also do this by elimination. If it's not the string that I want, then I know the other branch may be the one that I need. So I'm just writing down on a piece of paper the locations, 8048-2F0. Um, now you can see 2F0 is used twice, so I'm suspecting that's not uh, printing the, uh, um, um, RTF DMCA. So the other thing we can also do since we're inside a pager is we can look for put s. Okay, so we can look at all the calls to put f, put s, put string. So here's one which has a different address. So this one has an address of eight zero four eight five six c before the before the call, and then this one is five five zero. All right, so I think I got a pretty good idea of the general area where the strings are located. So let's go to that location of 8048 to something, right? So we are at uh, four something, we want to go back to 2F0. So let's go back to F0. Um, let's see. That's the function. Oh, that's the function itself, okay. Yeah. So you need the other two numbers. Oh, the two other numbers are 550 and 56C. Five, Those are going to be your strings. That's going to be the strings at the end. 550. Uh, five, five, right there. Uh, yep, okay. So it, it, it disassembled this, but when you look at the bytes, there's a sort of pattern again. Because when you look at all of these bytes, they are not really that random. They are all within, yes. well, guess again, what is the range? Printable ASCII, Printable ASCII range, which is going from uh, 2, 0 in hexadecimal to about 6F in hexadecimal. That's, with, that's the range of characters or ASCII code of characters that are printable. So this is telling you that this is most likely you know, ASCII code and not really actual code in the program. So now we need to look at this and go like, okay, but which portion is what, okay? There are easy ways to do this. So what I'll do is I'm gonna quit out of this program and do a hex dump dash, I think lowercase c or uppercase c, I cannot remember which one, but you know, it's a tool, okay? So this program is a lot simpler compared to uh, object dump. This one is just saying, okay, show me the ASCII code of every single byte in this file. Okay, and that file doesn't have to be executable. It can be a text file, it can be a docx file, whatever, okay? And now what I'm gonna do is to scan through here to look for stuff that I can recognize. Okay, yeah, not quite, oops. Um, not that. Oh, welcome back, trusted user, okay. Well, that's something that might be useful, right? Um, so what I'll do is I'm gonna write down the hexadecimal numbers here. Five, seven, okay, let me just show you what I mean. Five, seven, six, five, six, C, six, three, you know, which is the beginning of welcome. I just need a few bytes, okay? I don't need to remember the entire thing because I'm just looking for that sequence of bytes when I go back to object dump. And you can also see, you know, RTF, uh, DMCA is over here. Is that okay so far? Does, does everybody kind of see what I'm trying to do? No, you're not trying really. To want, you're trying to narrow down the exact segment of code that contains the password. Correct. Or I, I want to bypass that condition. 
by controlling the return point of the code that is currently causing the program to crash. Okay. So, so I, I, I got this now, okay? So I can go back to object dump, and this time I know exactly what I'm looking for, which is um, going to the end of this code. Um, it's 5765. So we need to look for 5765. Okay, where is that? 56C. Okay, it's about here. So we're looking for 5765. 57 is third line down. Yeah. All right. Five, seven, six, five, six, six, six. So 550 is the one that I want. That's the location. That's, that's representing the branch that is saying, yes, your password is correct. Okay? So I just need to know. That's the clue. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to write here and circle the correct range. And I go back and say, okay, give me 550. Okay, so here's the um, here's the 550, and I'm locating a conditional branch that is previous to this because a conditional branch is kind of like a conditional statement in C or C++. It it relates to a conditional statement in C++. So that means you know it is representing the beginning of a branch. So I can see the beginning of the branch is here with 488 as the uh, beginning of the branch. So now I write down the location, the exact location of that branch, which is 8048499, okay? That's the, uh, that's the exact location. In other words, I'm writing down this address here. Yep. The reason you know it's a branch is because it's using the sub command, I'm just assuming. It's using the JE command. JE is one line above? Yeah, the JE right here. But you're going to record the subline. I will branch to the subline because the subline oh, is actually doing something with the stack pointer, which is probably important. Okay, so this is where I am you know, branching to, you know, just so that it will you know, get straight into the branch that says, you know, yes, I have access to the full feature of the program. And now, uh, um, unaware of what we're doing, would we also would we not be interested in the in the test line because? Isn't that where it's probably testing? It's testing something, right? It's testing something. The test line is testing whether EAX is zero or not. But that's exactly the result after the comparison, after the, the script, after the, the code that compares whether your password <coughs> is really the password or not. And since I'm trying to bypass that code, I don't oh, want to branch the test. You just get past all the uh, tests. Oh, exactly. Okay. I'm bypassing all the tests. Oh, okay. I want to ju jump straight into the branch that I need to get into. Oh, Okay, so now I know this is the this is the return address that I want to use. So now I need to specify exactly that number in the password.txt file as the last four bytes. But they have to be in the reverse order. We'll, I'll explain why that is the case. You know, today is not that day. Okay, so I need the ordering of the bytes to be nine nine, um, eight four, zero four, and zero eight. Uh, four eight nine nine four eight. 9984 because the reversing only applies every two digits. Because every two digits is a byte. Oh, I see. Yeah, because every two digits is a byte, I'm only changing the ordering of the bytes, but not the bits within a byte. I'll explain all of that later, okay? So that's not a, I'm just giving you a gist of you know, what, what is going on here, okay? All right, so to do that, I have, um, let me see if hex edit is here, nope, okay, fine. I'm going to install another program. I think it's beer. Yep. There's a program called hex edit, which is kind of the counterpart of hex dump, because this program allows you to go into any file, text, executable or not, or whatnot, to change individual bytes to whatever you want. Even like say stuff that's somehow? If you have right access to that file, you can do it. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to show you exactly what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to run the you know, hex edit to test password.txt. Okay, um, and I navigate all the way to the last few bytes, the ones that are causing problems. Now this 0a is really not a, a part of the four bytes because a 0a is a line key character, which is an end of line character marking the end. It's, it's equivalent to backslash n in C or what is it in uh, C++? There's a uh, 
Uh, no, it's still backslash. No, 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 no. But but you're not supposed to use that. Oh no, it's end of line. End of line. E O L N. E N D L in C plus plus. Okay, that's why I don't like C plus <laughs> plus. Making me type all the extra stuff. Oh, uh, okay. So you use the cursor key to go back to the location where you want to make the change. So I'm going to reverse the order. Remember, so it's nine, uh, nine. so it's nine nine eight four. Zero four zero eight. Okay, and then we can save the file. I think it's just Control X. Yep, save. Yes. Okay, there we go. So now we have a password.txt file that has some unprintable characters. So if you do a VI or any type of editor on it, it's not going to show. Okay, so if I, I'll just show you. So you can see some gibberish here in dark blue. That's because VI is already one of the more friendly editors that can show you binary code. But if you use any, anything else, it's going to show you as some gibberish, OK? All right, so we're going to run the program again. And um, I'll be brave and just run it without um, GDB. Do you see? Oh, oh, I know it gives you a segmentation fault, but, but welcome, user. prior to that, it says, welcome back, trusted user. In other words, it will crash at the end of the session of running this program. But that's OK, because I'm not going to quit running the program until I'm done using the useful feature. And it does tell me that I have access to the useful feature already. <laughs> it sort of crashes when you're done with it? It does. <laughs> 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 like, like imagine like uh, getting into I don't know, Microsoft Word or something. Like you, you, you get the program ready, you do what you want to do with it, you close it and it crashes, so what? Like I got to get it going, I got to get whatever yep. I want out of it as many times as I want. Because that I so what you call the bypassing. Left. Avoid left. Yep. <laughs> so this is how you hack a program. Now, if, if anyone thinks, okay, those of you who have taken classes from me or know me, know that I cannot possibly remember the details of doing this, okay? I cannot remember what I said in the previous sentence. People keep asking me. So can you repeat what you just said? No, but it's screen recorded. <laughs> I, I can replay the stream that is still being recorded to give you a time loop, but it, it, it does work. Um, but, but this is the logic, okay? So all I could remember was the mechanism, the logic, and also you know, just the, 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 the basic stuff, okay? The, the, the uh, construction of the stack and stuff like that. That's all I could remember. I could not remember exactly how to hack this program, you know, or that, you know, 99. 84 you know code you know I cannot remember any any of that so I was actually just doing this entire process as if I got the problem today I, I could not remember a single step okay so now the question is is this important to you and why is it important if you think it is important because if you're writing something secure and you don't want to have holes like that Exactly. So reason number one is you do not want this to be your program, the program that is being hacked to be your program. Now, especially if you're if this program is running on some kind of you know high end you know, jet fighter and whatnot, right? Because not only is the program crashing when it's not supposed to, it gives people a way to control it you know, with unauthorized access. Okay. So that's reason number one. Yes. I was just going to say so. Um, the tools that I use in this process, you know, if you kind of go back and replay the tape, um, the compiler is out, okay, because I, I pre compiled this program, I stripped out all the simple table and whatnot. In other words, I'm pretending this program is shipped to me by a vendor, okay, that's the premise. So the compiler is out. But GDB is the tool, okay, that's a, one of the most useful tools because you can interactively figure out what is going on when you execute a program. So GDB is one tool. Object dump, OBJDUMP is the other program because it allows you to disassemble the program so you can look at you know, the code, the actual interpretation of the binary code of an executable. So that's the second one. The third one is hex uh, dump, which is just dumping out you know, the content of a file. It makes it easy to locate strings and stuff like that. The fourth one is hex edit, which allows you to change a file by manipulating the actual byte value you know, arbitrarily. You can just locate a particular location and say, I want to change this by to this. So for security purposes, if, um, is there 
is there any way to make it so that you basically can't do a dumb on a on program? Yes and no. Okay. So <laughs> So if this stuff bothers you because you are going to make some really you know interesting program and you want to protect it with patents and whatnot, you know, because you don't want people to be able to do this kind of thing, you can make it a web or cloud resource. So that way the actual executable is never exposed to the end user. So as long as you've got access to the executable, you can get the get the dump on it. Yes, as long as you have the executable, you can dump it. Now, there are programs called opt, opt, obfuscators, which, you know, which will try to crank out optic code that is hard to read. So things are all over the place. They have a lot of unnecessary branches, just, that, just so that you know, it, it turns structured code into spaghetti code, intentionally. So it would be much harder for me to figure out you know, how to hack the program. So there are people who do that as well, okay? But what, what do you think is the reason why, you know, what, what, is, what is a reason why this might be important um, as far as you are concerned as a student? Okay, once again, I'm gonna ask that you know, question. How many people plan to get a job? Okay, so what kind of job is hot in computer information science? Security, okay. And now I know gaming is really good. You know, people like gaming. It has a lot of glamour and stuff like that. But for the most part, gaming is really just competing. A, a, you know, competing with other gaming company. It's competition. It's tough competition. Lots of money is out there. People. You know, um, I think even a few years ago, the game industry has already uh, exceeded the movie industry in terms of revenue yeah. as an industry. Okay, so you, if you think about it, that's a big deal, okay? Because we look at Hollywood like, oh, that's a huge industry, it's a big asset of California. But guess what? The game industry has already exceeded that income you know, a few years ago. So gaming is good, um, but when the you know, economy goes bad, what do people do first to kind of save money? Stop upgrading their games, right? Stop buying new games, you know, stop paying more for the upgrades so and stuff like that. They, then they start to hack the games, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so in other words, you know, the game industry is definitely sensitive to the economy as a whole, okay? Because it's a luxury, okay? You know, people may do not need that to survive. They will have to buy food first, right? Pay rent, pay the gas bill, electric bill, so on and so forth before they say, oh, I got some money spared to play games, okay? But what about security? What about computer security? Is it something where you can say, well, the economy has gone bad, you know, I don't think security is important anymore. <laughs> it's really quite the opposite, don't you think? Yeah. When the economy goes bad, people are poor, people are saying, okay, I got nothing to lose. So it makes actually the, the, the importance of security actually goes up, right? Now, think about competition. When you talk about games, um, name a few big developers of games. Okay. Okay. So they are all competing with each other, right? But nonetheless, each one, each entity is a company, is a corporation. Okay. As big as a corporation as it is, it has limited resources. Okay. When it comes to security, what are the what is the level of entities that are at war with each other? Facebook, Microsoft, Google. No. Uh, we are talking about countries. We are talking about countries with possibly, you know, up to more than a billion people. I'm not going to name those countries. <laughs> Instead, I will give you something better. Instead of naming the countries and people can say, oh, that's false accusation, you know, and stuff like that, I'm going to give you, uh, what is the name of that website? Um, map of cyber attack. Okay, let me, let me see out of these things here. This is, this is a good one. Uh, Norse Corp. And it is a little bit intensive in terms of power. This is not World War II or three. <laughs> it's happening in real life now, real time. Okay, so these are all you know basically launches of attacks, cyber attacks. So all you gotta do is build something in 
and you can see, <laughs> and you can you can look at this. You can watch this like all day long, and you can figure out you know what is happening here. It is not corporations competing with each other. It's countries, you know, trying to get to each other. Okay, we are talking about a completely different type of scale when it comes to adversary. Okay, this is not just you know oh across the street you know in the Silicon Valley those are our competitor you know they occupy like a big campus no we talk about the whole country here. Is that the Pentagon? Is that what I'm talking about? Is it like this? Yeah, so. So Seattle is about here, and I don't know exactly what is that. San Francisco. That's Chris. San Francisco. So San Francisco. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to zoom in here. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we look at the house. Where is that? Let me call it. Where's Harry Fifty One? Whoa, what's the other one? San Francisco. Yeah, that's definitely San Francisco. Ouch. Ouch. I, I found that one. <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> but this is this is interesting. It gives you an idea of what is going on in real life. Okay, and you know these adversaries do not take a break when the economy goes down. Which means if you are looking for a job and you get into computer security and you are established in that industry, you don't have to worry as much when the economy goes bad. <laughs> now, on the other hand, if you need to go out of the country, you might have difficulties if you're really, really that good. Okay, so, but instead of focusing on this, let's focus on this part here. And just, you can see who's launching and who is receiving the attacks. So green. There's a sustained attack? Is that what that is? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it looks that way. It looks like an energy beam thing, huh? <laughs> it looks like an energy beam from a ball on warship. Oh, and what country is that? EDOS attack. <laughs> <laughs> that might be exactly wow. what it is. So, there, there you have it. Okay, you know, this is the reason why computer security is important. And Oh, because your mouse is over there. You gotta move. You gotta move your mouse. Like that. What? In the middle. Yeah, say that. There you go. You want to zoom into that portion? Yeah. There's a lot of mics on here. Where is uh, North Korea? Just for. <laughs> Are you kidding me, George? <laughs> hey, hey, I'm a computer science major, not a science fair. This is a this is a Korea Peninsula. This is North Korea. Going in. Yeah. <laughs> okay, with, with North Korea, um, they say that you know at night, you know, from outer space, uh, the United States, even China. Okay, you can see a lot of the major cities just lighting up. In, you, know, you can see, you can literally see with bare eyes. You know, the, the lights from those cities, okay? Mm -hmm. And with North Korea, it's like pitch black. <laughs> 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 which is a very sharp contrast compared to South Korea, which is right next to it. You know, it lights up a little bit at night too, because Seoul is actually really close to the, uh, the DMZ. Uh, so it's a really, really you know, sharp contrast in between those. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so the point is I am teaching you guys, you know, you know, simple hacking, and some of you may ask, but tech, is that really legal? Can you teach that stuff in a class? Yeah. It is illegal if I use a commercial program to illustrate it. Then I would have violated the FDMCA, the Fine <laughs> Digital Millennium Copyright Act, okay? Um, on the other hand, if I wrote that program to begin with, I'm just hacking my own program. And I cannot, you know, they cannot say that you know, this is not good because you are trying to circumvent the copyright of somebody else's program. No. Now, from the ethics perspective, do you think it's ethical to teach hacking? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If I don't teach you guys hacking, do you think that will stop the actual hackers no. from hacking? No. 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 Okay. Exactly. Hacking class, yep. So there you go. So I'm giving you the tools, but it's also related to this class. Oh. Oh. <laughs> what? It just happened. Oh, okay. You can see the simultaneous launching of attacks. 
right? Okay, so where is right? Yeah. You'll hear about it on CNN. <laughs> it actually shows you if you have a screen large enough, it shows you where is the origin, like what city. Attack Microsoft Corporation. Actually, Microsoft, Microsoft is a bunch of attacks. Oh, that's a that's a constant beam before between these two. Yeah, Microsoft's fighting with someone. <laughs> oh. Those Chinese know how to do it. Well, if you look at the number of spots, if you look at the number of spots here, you can see how it's kind of distributed over the entire country. It's not just one single spot that's launching the attacks. And that tells you something too. Does this show you how many actually get through? Um, I think it is. Uh, the larger the bubble, uh, the more, the higher the frequency coming from that region. Does it break it like? And so wait, so like, so um, can they keep like if you're watching this live, would this have been able to show when, say, uh, whoa, a big corporation gets gets like, uh, a DNS attack targets America's? Oh, look at that! I mean, it was just <laughs> <laughs> it's like coordinated attack, which is probably not uh, uncommon. I mean, because you know, if you want whoa, to flood the server, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, so would this be able to show like a, a DNS attack? Probably, but I'm not sure. Okay, you know, this is I I just do this, you know, just for entertainment. <laughs> but the bottom line is, I want, I'm trying to connect the content of this class, which is assembly language programming. I'm hoping that at least some of you at the end of this semester can revisit the video that I captured today and fully understand exactly what is going on, what it, what I actually did today when I hacked the program. That's the objective, okay? You know, I want you guys to be able to come back to today at the end of the semester and say, I now understand exactly what went on on that day. Yep. Is that why you've got that, the uh, two little things in your, uh, what is it, in your Moodle, hack this 32 and 64 bit program? Yep, yep, so that's exactly what I have. That's exactly the program that I downloaded and hacked. Oh, so you showed us how to hack that program? Yes. Huh. Yeah, that's, it. That's, that's exactly what I showed you. <laughs> so I'm not sure whether you guys feel this is fun or not. You know, some people do not seem to think, you know, uh, this is, so where do I get my grade? <laughs> um, but I think, you know, in, in. Do you have a grading program we can have? <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the thing about grading is I am a procrastinator. So you can't even hack it unless you have a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> you, you will need a TARDIS first. <laughs> so go hack the, um, the Time Lord's you know, home planet first so you can get a time machine or TARDIS. Then you can come back and go to the near future and hack my you know, grading program. <laughs> it complicates things a little bit. <laughs> And make sure that you don't run into the DeLorean <laughs> when you're time traveling. I have a t-shirt with uh, the DeLorean running into the, uh, the TARDIS. <laughs> all right, well, the lecture portion is all done. Do you guys have any questions of any kind? This is not something that you are going to do as a homework assignment. So if you're not really quite sure what happened, it's no big deal, OK? Um, but I do want you guys, you know, for those of you who did make some connection, it's like I kind of have a general idea of what is going on. I, you know, throughout the semester, just kind of go back to this lecture and try to connect to the concept that I talked about today. Okay, because this is like the, the culmination of all the stuff that I will be teaching this semester. Sweet. All right, so I'm going to stop the recorder before I get myself into more trouble. <laughs>